As we remain standing, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day, a new day, another day we may experience your goodness and your grace. We may be surrounded by your presence and your power. We come before you in Jesus' name, for there is no other name whereby we can stand before such a holy and mighty God. But we thank you that we may also, through Jesus, call you Father. And even as we say that word, Father, your spirit bears witness with our spirit that we indeed are the children of God. And we praise you for that this morning. And thank you that being your children that binds us together in one family. And we praise you, Father, for the ages that are represented in this part of your family here in this family time service. We thank you for those who are ministering away today. We pray for Chris and Lynn as they conclude the weekend with the Woodbridge Church, that you would anoint their ministry among their friends there. And we pray for the people at Little Fishes on Sunday, that there too may be a real sense of your presence and your power in Toffwood this morning. And where our thoughts are <clears throat> with those we know and love who are not immediately with us in this locality, Lord, we pray your blessing on other church families and other friends and relations, that we ask your blessing upon them as we ask for ourselves that we will be responsive to your presence here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Well, it is a, a family service, and uh, thank you, uh, James, for leading us off in the sung worship time. There will be opportunity for the children and even a team of young people to take part in our service. Um, so I'm going to ask particularly the young people and children, to have a real heads up in what we're going to be talking about and looking at. There's going to be a video on the screen in a little while there because there might be one or two questions that I want to ask of you at that time. So we're looking as a bit further in the story of Moses. Chris and George have already started us off in the early part of Moses' life. And we're carrying on in chapters 3 and 4 of Exodus, the story of that encounter that God made with Moses at what we call the burning bush. And then some of the excuses, again we've heard a little bit about this last week, uh, but some of the excuses that Moses gave why he shouldn't be the person to be sent to be the leader of God's people out of Egypt back into the promised land. So let's get up to date a little bit and remember kids and youth, uh, just keep your heads up and listen to what we're saying here, and I think there's going to be, a, oh, it's up there already, right. So the encounter with God found in uh, Exodus 3 and 4. Now, I guess, actually, Moses is one of the most fascinating characters in the Old Testament, and his life is really split, as we have heard already, into three almost equal parts of 40 years. Um, the first part is uh, very specially starts with his miraculous preservation, really, uh, in the River Nile as he was put there and spotted and ended up in the courts of Pharaoh. And for 40 years, he was a prince in Egypt. Something very special happened to him. God was in charge of his life. He got something marked out for him. And the second 40 years, well, something quite different seems to be happening because he's a shepherd for his father-in-law's flocks in the land of Midian. And uh, he's going to go down to, uh, into the Sinai Peninsula and he's going to go to what we would call the area of Mount Sinai today and he's going to have this encounter with God. But why did he end up as a shepherd when he was at one time a prince in Egypt? Well, we heard the story last week, so it's a dumb question to ask, so I'll answer it myself. Why would he um, end up as a shepherd? Well, he tried to do God's work for him. And he saw one of his own Hebrew fellows being uh, uh, ill-treated by a taskmaster of the Egyptians, and he ended up killing the Egyptian. And it ended up with him knowing that the Pharaoh know that, knew that he'd uh, killed an Egyptian taskmaster, and he fled for his life and ended up marrying the daughter of this man in uh, Midian. And so that's why he ended up there. For 40 years, he was a shepherd 
looking after the sheep and learning all sorts of lessons about himself and, the, and uh, God in that time. And the last quarter of the uh, third of his life, those 40 years, he was the leader of God's people, doing miraculous things in God's power to lead the people out of Egypt. But that's another story, really, for later on. But he saw amazing miracles. God used him to receive the law to be given to the people of Israel over the years. And he all but led them into the promised land. But what happened there between being a shepherd and being the leader of God's people. Hey, but we know the story, don't we? Because there was this encounter that Moses had on Mount Sinai as he saw the burning bush there. Uh, I need some help. I've got a box here. It's got some things in it, possibly. Who's going to unwrap a present for me? Uh, okay. Be very quick with it and uh, very careful with it. Open it up quickly. And uh, somebody else has got number two. Who's got number two here? Yeah, you can do number two. Open it up. Very gentle with that one. Don't push it or touch it. Number... Th oh, hello, that's alarming. <laughs> oh. All right. Number, number three. There we are. You can do number three. An oh, alarm clock. Um, number four. Oh, what have you got? A police car. That's fun. Um, would you like to undo that one, sir, please? Very quickly and gently. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, so what do we got here? We've got a police car. And we've got a um, light wand. And we've got a horn. Now, what's the same about all these things? What's the, what would all these things do? Make noises. Yes, this one, it probably won't. No. It makes an alarm noise. It makes an alarm noise, does it? Yep, it goes bing! Yeah, but it's not at the moment, anyway. It'll probably go off in five minutes' time to tell me to stop. Um, the police car. You've got a good head. Yeah, you're a bit noisy though, aren't you? Right. And uh, where's the light wand? Right. This doesn't make a noise, but it's a light. And it's a... But it's also a warning one as well. It flashes. And uh, the last one... <laughs> so, in a way, all these things are saying... Pay attention! Pay attention to the alarm clock, get up. Pay attention to the police car, get out of the way, he's on a, 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 a journey. Um, pay attention, please, I need some help. Or pay attention because I just like making a noise. <laughs> Whatever those things. And in a way, God is saying to Moses at this time, in the burning bush, at the burning bush in Mount Sinai, he's saying, wake up, Moses, pay attention got something for you because sometimes we're so sleepy not just physically but sometimes we're so sleepy with God we just need a big wake-up call to what God wants to say to us well we're going to watch a video now and it's a story rather than reading it out of the Bible we are going to have it on the screen there it's a story of Moses at the burning bush shall I just put that back in the box <laughs> yeah smile smart right um, <clears throat> so it's a uh, and uh, youth team, children, wherever you are. And if you are a child and would like to take part in a little uh, exercise later on, because you're going to go out into the back room in, in a little while and do some colouring and things and then come back and see what you've been doing. If you'd like to come down, you can be part of the children's team as well. So how about that? You're important, you're important, the rest of us are important. Okay, here it goes. Little one. Be careful. I've never seen anything like that. I've got to take a closer look. You probably have more sense than I have, little one. Doesn't harm the bush. And when he had 
climbed to the place, God called to him out of the midst of the fire. Moses. 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 I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm right here. Take off your shoes, for you are standing on holy ground. Taking off my shoes. Uh, sir? I'm the God of your fathers. The God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cries, for I know their sorrows. Therefore I will send you, Moses, to free them and you will bring my people to serve me upon this mountain. Who am I, Lord, to do this? If I go back to Egypt and say I'm sent by God, nobody will believe me. They'll, they'll ask me, what God? What's this God's name? What will I tell them? I am that I am. You will say, I am has sent me to you. This is my name forever and they will believe you. Now go. I will be with you. Lord, they're going to need more than my word. Moses, cast your staff onto the ground. Diseased. Huh. Put your hand back inside your robe and draw it out again. Show the people these signs and they will believe. Give them my message and they will follow you out of Egypt to this mountain and then you will lead them to their true home a land that will flow with milk and honey for them all. Lord, I trust your judgment, but I'm not that great a speaker. Use your brother Aaron to help you. Do as I have instructed, Moses. I will be with you. the story. Um, I need a team of kids over here, so you'd yeah, just like to stand around here, and uh, yeah, and I think Nicola's going to stand with you, be your team leader. Any other children like to uh, join us? Any other children like to come down and join? Yeah, well, we'll be waiting for you, and uh, a youth team over here with Andrew, I think. Look at these people willing to risk their reputation. Oh, Gabby's going to do it, all right. Don't worry, that's not my stomach rumbling, it's the motorbikes outside. Would you like to take that? And Gabby, if you'd like to take that, please. Okay, just going to have a little quiz now so the adults remember the story. It's for them, really, it's not for you, you understand this. So we'll go, put a question to the children first. Okay, you're listening. I hope the, children, uh, the questions aren't too hard, but do you remember how Moses was kept safe as a baby? He was put in a... Basket. In the... Re basket. Yes, in a basket, okay. I reckon, what, what, was, the what was the basket put in? The river, yeah. river Nile, all right, you can have a sweep for that. And, of course, there were two questions there, all right. And now the young people, 
How, what do you like to be called? Youth? T team, team Youth. Right, Team Youth. What name was given to the kings of Egypt at that time? What name was given to the kings? Quickly, please. We haven't got a lot of time here. Pharaoh, right. That was very good. And uh, children's team, what did Moses become and what did he do for a job when he went into the, the land of Midian? Yes. Shepherd. He was a shepherd. What do shepherds do? They look after sheep. Right, another. Oh, sorry. Another one. Excellent. We've got some very bright children here. What position, now this is a little tricky, what position did Moses father-in-law hold in Midian? What was he? What was his job? What was his role? <laughs> it wasn't actually in the story, but because you're so biblically alert and well-trained, and Andrew will tell you just in case. <laughs> Sack the youth leader. Anybody on this side? No. I thought this was an easy one. He was a priest, wasn't he? You did? Uh, she, just said, she was just about to say rabbi. Have three. <laughs> All right. Because James is, well, you have one for it. Right. That means you can't sing later on. All right. Uh, what was unusual about the bush that Moses saw? It was on fire, but it wasn't, it wasn't burnt up, was it? Okay. Right, and the next one is, what did God tell Moses to do as he came near to the bush? Take his shoes off. Right. Do you realize he was wearing flip-flops? Yeah. And you never knew that Moses was an American, but it was, it was on the film, so it's on the screen, it must be true. Right. Can you remember two of the signs that God gave to Moses so that the people would listen to him? We saw them on the screen. You get two for this. Yes? <laughs> yes, he got it. His hand put inside a robe and it went diseased, put it back again, it came clean again. And the other one was the... <laughs> but then back again. Right. Okay. Um... And can you give us two of the excuses that Moses made as to why he couldn't do this thing that God told him to do? <laughs> I must hurry you up, please. <laughs> he wasn't a good speaker. Yeah. He felt it was a bit short. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't as short, it wasn't a good speaker, but it was something else. It, it came from over here. They wouldn't believe him. There you are. Right. Let's have a see now. What was the name of Moses' brother who God said would help him speak? Anybody else wants to say? Yes? Um, what have you got on your head? Hair. And he had as well, he got hair on. Aaron, Aaron, yes, okay, depends where you come from. Okay? And uh, over here, what was the name, this is a tricky one, what was the name of Moses' wife? Zipporah. Yes, Zipporah, yeah, well done. Didn't give you any clue at all. Okay? And what did God say the land would be flowing with that they would go into? Be such a lovely place it would be flowing with. Um, yeah, it would be water there, but there was something else. Honey and milk. Honey and milk. Mm. I don't think it was literally honey and milk, but it meant it was going to be a very nice place. Oh. And because there were two things there. Right. Okay. Now, this is for any adult on this side of church to help the youth team. Um, oh. oh, no, sorry, no, it's, you've got another one yet, yeah, one of yours. What did God say to Moses he would, his name to give to the uh, Israelites in Egypt? He said, you'll be known as? I am. I am, will do. That's right. <laughs> We're having to be very quick. What's the Oh, crumbs. Right, okay. And uh, any adult on this side of the church first. Um, 
how old was Moses when he died and where did he die? He was, Alan says 120, all those in favor of 120, and where did he die? On Mount Pisgah or Nebo in the land of Moab. So one for you, and one for you, Alan. Good. And on this side, what was Moses' father's name? Anybody on this side? No, that was his father-in-law, was Jethro. What was his father's name? He thought he was a sheep, because he said, my name is Amram. And you can find that in Exodus 6. So you find out, and his mother's name was Jechabod. Okay, you don't get any for that. How many have you got in there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How many of you got in there? Nine? You don't mean say the youth won. Eleven. Hooray. Good, okay. If you go back, thank you ever so much, youth team. Thank you very much. Jane. Quick anecdote, which I'm led to believe is a true story. There was a geologist and a priest, and they were having a conversation. Don't worry, it's not a joke. Uh, so it's technically a true story, as I understand it. And the geologist said that um, he's been doing some research, and he's discovered that at the time of the Exodus, the Red Sea was only six inches deep. And uh, the priest suddenly went, praise the Lord. And the geologist said, well, why are you praising God? I've just proved that the Bible is falsified. And the priest said, no, I'm praising the Lord because the entire Egyptian army got swept away in six inches of water. <laughs> Kids. Do we all know? Our great big God. Yeah, that. <laughs> Our God is a great big God. Come and stand out the front so everyone can see. I certainly used to know it. Otherwise, Joshua was going to be doing a solo. Ready? <laughs> That was appalling. <laughs> Been practicing that and everything. <laughs> I should let Graham start. <laughs> Our God is a great big God. Our God. 
God is a great big God and he holds us in his hands 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 You go through these doors here there's some tables with some uh, activity sheets on and we'll see you a little bit later okay well we're going on now to hear a little bit more of the story um, don't think we'll have that again just a reminder those three parts of uh, Moses lifetime and now his encounter with God and his call by God you know, I think in a way, when God speaks to us, whenever that is in our life, whether it's reading the Bible probably sometimes, or whether it's listening to Chris preach up there, or maybe going through the countryside and something really amazing just speaks to us, there's always something going on in our lives that means that we take notice of what God's saying to us as a context of the call. And I think in many ways, what was going on in Moses' life for those 40 years when he was in the wilderness was that he has, his life was shaped by a sense of failure. Why? Well, we know he had tried to uh, help his uh, Hebrew friend by, in effect, killing one of the Egyptian overlords. And he had to run away, uh, away from Egypt. And it, uh, we re can't find it here. And... Uh, <clears throat> That's right, uh, that he, he ran for his life and he ended up being a, um, what's the word? Um, <laughs> can't find the actual word I want, um, in uh, Midian. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and there he was in a situation where God spoke to him. And I don't know how you would feel in that situation if your life had been marked by failure, and to some extent, all of us are marked with things that have gone wrong in the past maybe a relationship, maybe something we've failed in, maybe somebody's hurt us, all these sort of things that can mark our life and shape our confidence. You know, if we're feeling, oh, I'm no good, we don't want to trust, we don't want to step out again, we don't want to venture with God. We may become cynical and say, I don't want to get hurt again, I, I don't go with these people who are venturing with God. The story of G.W. Bush George Bush, uh, when he was president, he was in the White House garden, and he met this character who was clothed in a white long robe, and he got a big white bushy beard with white bushy hair. And George Bush looked at him and said, I know who you are. I've read my Bible storybook. You're Moses. And this character just turned and looked away from him. He said, why are you turning away from me? You're Moses. And again, the guy said, he said, look at me, you're Moses, aren't you? And this character said, the last time I spoke to a bush, I ended up 40 years in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you got it, that's amazing. I'm really impressed. Just take heart, folks, God can speak to anybody. <laughs> I took a picture yesterday, a few days ago, uh, down Yaxham Road there, and looking up the railway line towards the station, what do you see? broken down carriages, rolling stock, just derelict. And sometimes that's how we feel sometimes. Maybe somebody in this room today feels as though I've been shunted into a siding, I'm broken down, I've had bad experiences in the past, I'm just being now put out to grass. Perhaps Moses felt a little bit like that. I was a prince in Egypt, but now I'm just a shepherd looking after dad-in-law's uh, sheep. At least it's not mother-in-law's sheep. But anyway, there he was. For 40 years he'd been a prince in Egypt, and Egypt was in him, he was in Egypt. And now it took 40 years, and Chris was speaking about this, to get Egypt out of Moses. And God was doing something else as well. He was not only preparing Moses in those 40 years, but he was preparing the people of Israel. They were groaning in Egypt, asking God to... Um, uh, deliver them. And they're getting intense. You know, when God speaks to us and we're going to do something difficult, sometimes he gets to a place when we're really, really desperate. And the people in Egypt now were getting desperate. Oh, God, save us! And they were going to get ready for Moses to come and tell them to do some amazing things. 
And there was a very clear call for Moses here as well. Okay, we're getting a little behind here, but there's a very clear call for Moses as well. Sometimes, as we said earlier with these things here, we need a wake-up call. I was driving back very close to Cambridge after a long journey one night, and Lynn was in the car, and maybe one of our children, I can't remember now. And every now and again, I'd go, I'm feeling a bit tired here. And we're just going down the M11, the side of Cambridge, about three miles away from home. And suddenly I heard, (laughs) and I'd fallen asleep. And I hit the rumble strip on the side of the motorway. And guess what? That woke me up. Otherwise, it could have been a fatal accident. And sometimes God wakes us up because of something very important that he's got to tell us. And God woke up Moses and said, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. And he used his name, Moses, Moses. Well, you'd expect, as we read in the Bible, that God would say Moses, wouldn't you? Because he's talking to Moses. But would you expect that God's going to speak to you in a very personal way? He knows all about us. And maybe we don't hear his name in our ears ringing out, James, James, just like that. But maybe at that time when you gave your heart and life to Jesus and you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Saviour, it was very personal to you. It was as though God was speaking into your life and world at that very time, as well as everybody else. And if you haven't had that experience of giving your life to Jesus and knowing that, He wants to know you and use you and has that personal interest in your life. Then that's something to talk about maybe later. And so God is saying to Moses, I know you by name. I've got a special task for you, Moses. And so as Moses meets with God, God has been shaping Moses' character. But now Moses is learning about God's character. And the first thing he's learning is about God's holiness. Take off your shoes, Moses. The place you're standing is holy ground. It isn't that no other ground in the world is holy, but at that place in the presence of God, there's something awesome about God's sinlessness and purity and beauty. And Moses, in his fallenness and his shame at that point, is told to take off his shoes. We do well to remember God's holiness. I think it's brilliant that we can call God Father, don't you? We can say, Abba. Father, God's spirit, witnessing with our spirit that we're children of God. But let's never forget that he's a holy God. He hates sin. He loves the sinner. We don't play fast and loose with this amazing, glorious God. When I was in Dallas for a year, uh, way back in the 70s, one of the things that impressed me about the family life there was many of the teenage boys, they used to call their father, what? Sir. Sir. But it was a term full of respect, but full of intimacy. There's something about that in our relationship with God that Moses needed to learn, to have a holy fear of God, and yet to be able to love God and have an intimate relationship with him. He was called the friend of God. So holding these two things together is so important as we venture with God, to recognize his holiness, his sovereignty over us, and yet his closeness to us and his desire to use us as his children. The second thing he had to learn really was that God does care for his people. See, the people in Egypt could have said, where's God in our lives? We're just being brutally ill-treated by the Egyptians. It just seems as though this God who was with our forefathers has left us. And, And Moses, it seemed, well, he did try and care for us, but he's scarpered. He's been gone for 40 years. Does God care? And we read in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 to 9, The Lord said to Moses, I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses had to learn that God is a compassionate God. He is a faithful God. And perhaps somebody in this congregation this morning is thinking, God's forgotten me. He doesn't care about me in our situation. Look at all the stuff that's been going on in our life, in our family, in our situation. It's rubbish. God doesn't care. To say that he's a faithful, loving God, no, it doesn't work. Look, I just want to remind you, God said he came down to the 
uh, Israelites in Egypt. Has God come down, if I can put it that way, not geographically, has God come into this world to say, I do care, I do love? This morning, if you're feeling, where is God in my life circumstances? Where is God in all the mess of my life at the moment, or my family's life? Just take a look here every now and again. Take a look at this cross and say, and God does not care? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so sometimes in those mysteries of the silences of God in our lives, we just need to hear again what Moses heard. I do care. I have seen, I have heard, I'm concerned. I have come to you. This morning, if that's you, just hear it again. Not three and a bit thousand years ago to Moses, but hear it to you. I have seen and heard. I am concerned about you, my child, and I have come to you. Yes, in Jesus 2,000 years ago, but I keep coming to you in Jesus by the Spirit today. If your life is at the bottom of the pit this morning, he says, I do know, I do care. And look at this cross and tell me that God doesn't care. He does. But I can't translate that into your circumstances, and you can't translate it into my circumstances. We have to hold that by faith. The darkness that hides us from God, sorry, God from us, never hides us from God. It may seem dark, but God sees, even when we can't see and understand what he's doing. James, let's have another a song here in response to the holiness of God.
to be seated again. We're going to move on with the last part of the story. And this is the third part of God's encounter with Moses, or Moses' encounter with God. We've heard that he's been learning about God's character. And uh, move it on. Remember those three periods of Moses' life. Remember that God has spoken to Moses. He's called him. And uh, we've learned more about his character, his holiness, and his care. But now he's going on to God's commission of him. And we read that God says to Moses, I am sending you. <clears throat> How would Moses feel at this time? Moses, I'm sending you. You failed once. You've been in the desert for 40 years. You feel you're a nobody. But I'm sending you, Moses. You're going to lead my people, all however many million of them there are out there. They're going to come back. And Moses thinks, right. And begins to make some excuses. Now, obviously, it's a very general sense that we too have a commission of God. In the upper room on Easter evening, Jesus said to the disciples, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We're not just a people who are following Jesus to be cosy, to come to church uh, on a Sunday, or to just believe certain things. We are a sent people. And to play on words, we are a people with scent, with an aroma of Jesus around us. We're a people that God wants to use whether we're young or old, Chris said probably it starts at 80, you know, that, or at least in the last bit of your life, but it's any period of our life, whether we're a young person, middle age, whatever it is, God says, I want to use you. That's the reason I called you, to be my own, to be a child who's part of my kingdom, to be spread something of kingdom life into the world where I've placed you, and only you can do it. But we, like Moses, we're going to struggle sometimes and put excuses up as Moses did. And the first excuse was, uh, who am I, Lord? And really, Moses doesn't, uh, God doesn't even answer the question. It's the wrong question. It's a question of, who am I, Moses, not who are you? And he says, what you need to learn, Moses, is like two sides of a coin. You feel you may have failed on one sense, that you're nothing, you're a nobody. But I am with you. And so the greater message is that I am with you in your weakness, in your brokenness, and I'm sending you, and I'm going with you in that. When you woke up this morning, when I woke up this morning, did I feel God is with me, or did I feel, oh, where's a cup of coffee? And as we go in our daily work, or maybe something specific that God has called us to, in our scary moments, God says, I am with you. I'm with you always. I'll never leave you nor forsake you there. Some verses are very precious to us. I remember going through quite a difficult time some years ago in a church we were in then. And a dear lady friend of Lynn's was speaking to us and encouraging to us. And she said, Lance, I want you to hear this verse from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. So do not fear, God said to um, to the people of Israel through Isaiah. For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my victorious or righteous right hand. You see, the thing isn't, who am I? That's what Moses felt. Who am I? It's who is God? How big is our God? We've been singing about it. So the excuse that Moses first put up was countered by God saying, I'm going to be with you, Moses. It's about me, not you. But then, quite rightly, Moses then says, well, well, what name shall I give to the people in Egypt? Saying, who's spoken to me? And God says, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. And this name of I am is a name, obviously, that Jesus also took later on. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The seven I am's, this special name. The word Yahweh that became the sort of name of God that the Israelites feared to utter sounds like the verb to be, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. But the Israelites were so afraid of mentioning the name of God 
that they put the vowel sounds of another word meaning Lord, Adonai, into the to become Jehovah. So they wouldn't use the word Yahweh. They would say Jehovah and said in case they were taking it in vain. But it means basically God says, I will. If I say something, I will. I am. I am the one who acts out of my own authority and power. If I say something, it will happen. In these verses in Exodus 3 and 4, you will worship me again on this mountain. The elders will listen to you. I will stretch out my hand. I will help you. So God says to Moses at this time, I am who I am. And if God says something, he means it. We were at a Thanksgiving service yesterday for a dear friend who died some little while ago now. And I was thinking those verses when Jesus speaks in the upper room to the disciples in John chapter 14. Jesus said, I will come again take, uh, to you and I will take you to myself. It's the same God who's speaking through his son to the disciples. I will. And if I say I will, I mean it. And I will. And so when God says to Moses, I will do all these things. Just use my name. I am who I am. Then that's the people will begin to learn that I am that God. What if they don't believe me, God? Well, we had the two signs, didn't we? The sign of the snake and the sign of the leprous hand as well. And those signs were going to be the signs that Moses was used to speak to the Egyptian people as well of God's unique power. Have you thought about those two signs in a way? The staff becomes the deadly serpent. But the deadly serpent becomes the staff of authority again. And the hand becomes diseased and deathly. Yet it becomes clean and pure again. Do you see a picture of what's happening in Jesus? There is a death that happens. But there's a restoration and there's a resurrection. And both those signs are saying in death, in disease, in trouble, there is restoration. There is my authority in the staff and there's life when the evil serpent's around. And their last excuse was, oh, I can't speak, God. I'm no use to speaking. Well, perhaps he was. Perhaps he was just making a complete pig's ear of it. You know, sometimes we are so afraid we put up the most feeble of excuses. He was educated in all the ways of Egypt. He was powerful in speech. But he said, no, I'm not. He'd lost that sense of identity. Chris was speaking about that before uh, last week. Have a look at this little quotation. Fear is the darkroom where the devil develops his negatives. The negatives of I can't, I'm no good, I can't speak. And fear is Satan's darkroom where he develops all these things into things that say, no, I can't. But God said, I've commissioned you, I am sending you, and I'm going to use you. And yes, okay, I'm going to use your brother Moses, uh, Aaron. <laughs> oh God, send somebody else, please. And of course, God gets a little bit angry with that and says, okay. And just imagine God saying in sort of American ease, okay, Moses, all your excuses, you've done now. Let's get on. Let's move on. Maybe somebody here this morning is saying, I've got all sorts of excuses why I shouldn't obey God in this thing or that thing. Always call upon my life. I've been denying it for weeks and months and years, maybe. Moses, God is saying to you as well as to Moses, all your excuses, I'm bigger than all those things. I am with you. You done now? Let's move on. Trust me in that. So, just a reminder that really it's when things move from head to heart. When things move from theory into practice. When things move from just memories into a message, that things really begin to take shape in relationship with God. And that's what he's speaking to us about this morning. He says, I have called you. He says, wake up and listen. I want to use you. He's speaking to us about his character. But we do serve a holy God, but he's a God who cares for us. And he says, I am commissioning you. I'm going ahead of you. Let me just put this last slide up. 
That's a picture of the Kohinoor diamond. It was given to Queen Victoria by an Indian prince when he was a child. Some years later, he visited the Queen again, and the Queen said, can I do something for you? And he said, you know that diamond I gave you when I was a boy? Can I have it back, please? Probably that's why the Queen was not amused. And anyway, the Queen gave, got the diamond and gave it back to him. And then the young prince said, now that I am a man, however, and have met you, and have become aware of the value of this stone, I wish to give it to you again. Please accept it again as a token of my loyal esteem for you. Maybe this morning it's a time for you to say to God again. Maybe my ventures with you in the past were a little bit ill-formed, a little bit weak, and I didn't really understand what you were saying to me, but today I want to say, Lord, I am yours. Please use me for whatever you want in these coming hours and days and weeks. And then like Moses, it's not going to be a burning bush, but it's an encounter with the living God. How good is that going to be?